So um, yeah, welcome to those of you who have actually signed in. So I'll hopefully, oh, good, got a confirmation that things are working well. Um, so absolutely here to answer your questions as we go through, and feel free to ask questions as we go along. So I'm sitting here in the um, offices of KOM Consultants with uh, Martin Kelly and Sue Gorman. And uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to actually talk to you today about um, our medical program at Flinders University and the two pathways that we have into this program. And I'll just assume that there is both um, undergraduate and graduate entry interest out there and those that have signed in and perhaps are watching this, this webinar. So Flinders University, as you can see from the first slide here, is, is quite a picturesque site. This is students actually sitting on the lawn um, on the main campus with a view out to the ocean in the distance, which is about 10 minutes by car um, from the campus. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through some of the uh, features of our university with a particular emphasis, of course, on the medical program. All right, so my name is Michael Jackson. I'm actually one of the academics in the College of Medicine. Um, part of my job uh, as an academic is also to look after the Bachelor of Clinical Sciences and Doctor of Medicine. Uh, double degree program, um, but my other jobs, of course, are both a, a lecturer and a researcher in um, the college, and with an interest in immunology, particularly autoimmunity, um, taking in things like type one diabetes, for example. Okay, so just I thought to start with a few bits and pieces on Adelaide itself. Many people don't really know Adelaide um, very well; they know Sydney and Melbourne often. Um, I would say that Adelaide is probably a combination of some of the better parts of both of those cities, and that being uh, too parochial there. But um, often we come up very highly on things like uh, livability and um, you know, top sort of scoring from in terms of uh, culture and uh, opportunities within the city itself. So we have about a 1.4 million population in Adelaide, um, typical for for most Australian cities, fairly spread out. So typically people live, lead a metropolitan style sort of lifetime uh, life. However, we do have lots of uh, typical Australian features, like um, a lot of beaches and coastline. Um, the good thing about Adelaide being a bit smaller is the fact that it's a cheaper place to live as well, uh, while still retaining all of the things that you expect from a major city, um, which is excellent. Just to point out, of course, that students who do come to Adelaide um, get concessional public transport as well, which is excellent. Uh, and the public transport system in Australia and Adelaide in particular uh, is not that expensive relative to many other parts of the world. So here's just some, some images of the local environment. This is an old beach, which is about a 15 minute tram ride from the city, for example. Um, we have um, obviously surrounded by ocean, there's lots of wildlife out there. There's the dolphins, we get whales and things down the coast, which is nice. Um, but typical for Australia, uh, lots of nice beaches and things. Um, and just down the road really from Flinders in the, the foothills around Adelaide is lots of things like wineries, which is typical for um, you know, South Australia in particular, is to have a lot of wine regions um, because of the favourable sort of climate that we have um, in South Australia. So Flinders University itself, which is um, these images are of the main campus. We actually, Flinders is actually set on a very, very large campus in the southern uh, foothills of Adelaide. Um, campus is about 580 uh, hectares in size, which is extremely large. Um, you can see here, we're up the hill a bit. We have a view down towards the flat parts of Adelaide. Just where my pointer is down here is where the Flinders Medical Centre is. So we're actually a combination of both a university and a medical precinct, um, particularly useful, of course, for medical students because they'll do most of their studies when they're doing medicine um, within the Flinders Medical Centre itself. But we have some excellent facilities for students. This is a new student hub. This is a close-up uh, view of it here. Um, this has retail shops, uh, food outlets, for example, and uh, student study areas. Uh, student cooking areas and also the screen for outdoor events and things like that from the stairs seating outdoors. So this is a fantastic addition that was opened a couple of years ago and has been very, very popular with students. Um, the university itself ranks pretty highly, in particular the medical course, which is in the top 10 
um, for medical courses in Australia, which is excellent. Um, comes very highly recommended by students itself. So number one, um, SA Uni for overall experience for students. And we have been growing at a reasonable rate over the years. So our, our student population is now up to about 27,000 students. Um, we were established back in the 1960s. Um, typical in Australia, a, a number of universities were established in metropolitan areas um, in Australia to, to cope with increasing student numbers, really, which um, arose from sort of the baby boom years. Um, so Monash University in, in Victoria, in Melbourne, would be another close uh, cousin to Flinders, really, in terms of uh, went with Bill from the style of university. Um, we have a international student population of around about 4,000 students. Uh, so uh, just a confirmation on the medical school ranking, where the rank is, is ranked within the top 10 for medical schools in Australia. So um, the other part about that, as we'll get to as we go through, is um, the role that Flinders actually played in, in innovation in medical education in Australia as well. Um, so we'll probably get to that now. So the medical program, which is actually delivered um, by the College of Medicine and is delivered largely in terms of teaching out of the hospital itself, um, as the university has teaching space in the hospital, um, has this ranking in the top medical uh, top ten within Australia, um, but really has has led medical education in Australia for a number of years, starting from when it was first established in the 1970s. Um, Flinders were the first to move to a graduate program in 1996, so the first medical school in Australia to offer a graduate program. Um, that model was subsequently taken up by a number of universities, for example, around Australia, this, this graduate entry, and we probably have more than 50% of school, medical schools in Australia now offering a graduate entry model. Um, other innovations as we moved through were was the first to offer an MD in Australia back in 2013. Um, so obviously we have this nationally and internationally renowned curriculum, um, evidenced by the fact that several other medical schools deliver the Flinders program. Um, they've bought, for example, the curriculum from Flinders over the years uh, and actually deliver the, the Flinders sort of model. Um, undergrad, there's questions about the undergrad. So Flinders has actually come full circle from 1974 or 5 to about 1996. Um, the program was entirely an undergraduate program. Um, then moved to a graduate program till about 2010. And then we've moved to both an undergraduate and graduate offering. So we've come back to our undergraduate roots in many ways. Um, but by modelling that undergraduate program on our graduate MD. Big feature, of course, is that the medical education component of the degree is delivered via the medical centre associated with Flinders. So just to bring that into perspective, um, I think students that are, are looking at medicine probably understand that there's multiple aspects to it, including the academic, clinical and research components. And of course, all three of those components are um, represented at Flinders and through the university and the medical centre precinct itself. So students are actually exposed to the academic and clinical education delivered by active academics and clinicians either based at the university um, or within the hospital, such as, as myself. Um, given that the MD is actually... Um, uh, so one question here, is it fully accredited as a medical school? Absolutely, in Australia. Definitely, in fact, um, Flinders got at its last accreditation was accredited for 10 years, which is the maximum accreditation time. Um, very, very few universities in Australia get that full accreditation. Um, so it just speaks to the, the quality and the organisation, I think, that's gone into the, the Flinders curriculum. We did spend a, about half a year getting the documents ready for that accreditation visit, but I remember it well. And um, it went down uh, without a hitch with the with the team. Yeah. So I've worked at the hospital now since the 1990s, so I've, I sort of know the changes that have happened both in the medical program and the hospital and the research side itself. We have some excellent research programs in addition to the medical school. Um, real strengths are in fact in things like neuroscience, um, some cancer, particularly gastrointestinal 
uh, tracks cancers, and also immunology with autoimmune disease being a feature as well. So, so those are real areas of particular focus um, within um, the medical school and the university in terms of medicine. But of course, there's many, many other research programs um, associated with academic teams um, within the university as well. So just talking about the ways in. So obviously, Flinders has this graduate entry model, which is based on the four-year Doctor of Medicine MD program. Um, typically, in Australia, um, students would come into this program after doing a three-year undergraduate degree. Um, we have other selection processes other than just the degree, of course. We include a uh, assessment called GAMSAT, which is a local Australian version of the MCAT. So either one of those two um, assessment tools is, is accepted for entry into our MD program, along with your undergraduate degree uh, GPA score, for example. That would typically be a seven-year progression for most students. And domestically, in Australia, most students, probably about 70% of our intake into the MD come through this graduate entry pathway. Since 2010, we've had an undergraduate um, direct entry two plus four year program that is two years of a Bachelor of Clinical Science plus four years of the MD, which gives a six year completion. So only really for students who show high academic standing, um, they get a discount over the graduate entry model of at least one year, of course, um, because the Bachelor of Clinical Science is is combined with the four-year MD program, uh, allowing students to graduate with both um, a Bachelor of Clinical Science and MD degree, so a double degree um, at graduation. Um, yeah, selection tools we use in addition to your Year 12 scores as you're coming in. For example, currently include things like an ISAT score for international students and an interview, for example. However, I will say that some of these selection tools are, are under review. So please contact or keep in touch with your um, KOM consultants, for example, just to make sure that you're on top of um, any changes that are being made to our selection process if you're interested in applying. For example. Um, does anyone have any questions perhaps about the, the entry pathways? Obviously, it covers both those students already in degree or those students thinking of heading into medicine straight from their high school study. So relatively straightforward. I will say also if you come in in the double degree pathway, all of the selection is at the beginning. We don't select from the Bachelor of Clinical Science student for progression. You're actually guaranteed to progress into the MD um, if you enter this program. The only stipulation is that you complete your first two years of study uh, without failing anything and um, achieve a grade point average of credit or better, for example. So in Australia, we have a GPA system out of seven, so that a five or more out of seven is required. But in my experience, 99% um, you know, of students uh, progress. It's only students who really change their mind, typically uh, um, over their entry into medicine who won't sort of progress into the MD. So what are the grades required for the undergraduate program? So Gus is asking, um, I'm just assuming that you mean um, the year 12 level. So we're sort of working on what that means and I think um, that perhaps uh, Sue will be able to direct you a little bit more to that. But it's an equivalent of 95, we have an ATAR system which is a ranking system in Australia. So it's equivalent to about a ranking of 95. And we've worked out, I think, a score of 90 here locally would be um, in competitive for perhaps putting in a, an application in. We also have this ISAT. Um, I've got another question. Preferable criteria for acceptance is really, it comes down to um, meeting the, ap the application um, grade requirement, which is, as I said, around about 90 or higher. And to, at the moment, we're also using an ISAT uh, assessment of a ranking of 50 or above. Um, that means that you can put in a, an application in um, and then we'll offer an interview to those students, <coughs> typically pretty much all students I think, who meet those, those, in, those application requirements will get an interview. 
And the interview is really a very slimline version of an interview. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's about a 30 minute uh, interview. It's usually one or two interviewers. And we have three sections. We're really just trying to get an idea of your communication skills and your suitability for um, medicine, for example. And we're not trying to you know, unpick your prior knowledge or anything like that. We don't expect people to have you know, vast knowledge of anything. It's really just an understanding within yourself why you're doing medicine prep and uh, for you to show reasonable sort of social skills and verbal skills. So ISAP score, really at the moment we've, we're using a ranking. So if you get in the top half of the ISAP ranking for any particular sort of release of grade, um, that will secure you an interview, I would say. But as I said, we're, we're looking at some of these things um, in terms of whether we continue to use them this year. So just keep, keep your ear out perhaps or, or keep an eye out for any updates about that. So I know that in Canada, the ISAP score as the agents have been talking to me about, is not a common thing. Yeah, so we'll get to the grades and things as we go through. So I'll give you some, some hard numbers on the MCAT score and um, GPAs and things as we, as we progress through the talk. So hopefully um, those, those questions will be answered as we head through. Okay, so this is um, for those heading into the undergraduate program, the two-year clinical sciences heading into the MD. Um, so this is just a, a breakdown of the type of topics, for example, that students will look at in the first two years and study. We are currently set up to have a medical science or health science stream. It doesn't matter which one you take. Um, both of them have these black topics here, for example, in common. So all students study these core topics in black down the middle here. And you can see here these topics are pretty much what you'd expect as a solid preparation for medicine. You've got um, molecular biology, the biology, chemical uh, chemistry studies, human physiology, um, some legal eth ethical aspects of healthcare. Um, for example, in the second year, a uh, higher level of those same type of topics are, are taken, along with this communication to improve patient care, which really sets um, students up really for their clinical um, skills studies as they progress in the MD. If you're a little bit more interested perhaps in medical research, you might consider the medical science stream. Um, topics associated with that stream include the skills in medical sciences 1 and 2. And this is largely about the methodology of research, for example, and what sort of approaches people can, can take to medical research. If you're a little bit more sort of um, focused on the health system itself, um, you may choose to take, for example, then the health science stream. And there you get exposed to topics that are a little more sort of talking to um, aspects of healthcare and so in, in relation to society. Um, can my parents stay with me during the study years? I've got a question. Um, so I would say it's up to you guys to organise that. I don't see any problem with that. Um, it's up to you know visa sort of requirements for the same. But certainly we have international students whose parents travel with out to Australia for a period of time, particularly in the beginning. Um, for some students, um, they find that you know, very comforting. Plus, it's a nice holiday for the parents. How long they stay, of course, is, is up to them. But uh, yeah, I, I would say that you know, um, visas notwithstanding, there's obviously an opportunity to stay for extended periods of time in various sort of visa, various visa conditions, I would say. Um, but you have to check that out. Um, in terms of staying with you on campus, because we'll talk to um, sort of accommodation options a little bit later on, um, but that would probably mean that you would probably stay as a family somewhere in, in private accommodation. Um, as part of your two-year course, um, both streams get electives. For example, there's three elective choices in the second year for the medical science stream and two for the health science stream. And um, this gives students a, a chance to tailor their studies and here's some of the sort of topics that students have taken in the past. Typically, you'll find that they're, they're favouring the biomedical style topics for their electives because they know in the first year and the second year of the MD, they'll be running into these topics as they go through their, their studies. So to get a head start in them um, is an excellent option. And most of the lecturers and academics doing these sort of topics are also the ones delivering the first year of the MD program, for example. Um, I've got a question about financial assistance. Um, we don't have any scholarships, unfortunately. 
Um, so no, I can't say from the university side there's, there's any real financial assistance, unfortunately. So sorry about that one. Um, something we're looking at, we're probably looking at some some rather sort of sort of low key perhaps um, scholarship uh, options that might come in the future, but not at the moment. Um, so Sarah is asking about the rounds of offers. Um, so we certainly are making ongoing or rolling offers at this point in time. We don't have sort of rounds as such. We're sort of doing um, a version of that when we have applicants, we are pushing them through into interviews. And once the interviews are done, within about four weeks of the interview, students are hearing back from, from the university about offers. So if we send out offers, for example, um, and people and students take them up, and then the, the course gets filled, we won't have rounds later on in the year. We uh, won't be sending out more offers later on in the year, really. So if you have an application that you're willing to put in um, soon and we can get an interview going, um, we can offer a, a place, and it could be conditional on you finishing your studies, for example, um, things like that. So Martin's just replying on some of these um, financial assistance questions, which is, is excellent. Um, the other thing to say is we do encourage students to take topics um, of their interest. So you may want to take a, a history topic or a language, for example, that's absolutely fine because we want people to, to sort of tailor their studies to their own interests a bit anyway. And it's always a good to have a bit of diversity in students as they head into medicine. So that's the undergraduate sort of um, structure. When you get into the MD, if you're a graduate entry, it'd be the first year. Of, for example, if you're a double degree program entrant, it'll be a third year of your sixth year program. So this um, graphic is really showing the basic structure of the MD program. So what you can see here is four major themes in the first two years and a clinical theme in the final two years, um, really leading, leading out with knowledge of health and illness. This is the largest block. Um, all the knowledge, the biomedical knowledge that you need, of course, to be a doctor, um, that knowledge about how the body works, the, the various systems of the body, Pathology and anatomy is all included in knowledge of health and illness. Um, so Sarah's asking about work afterwards in Australia. Um, absolutely, we have many uh, international students who stay on in Australia um, and work for a period of time. Some of them take up permanent residence options and then citizenship op options after that. So yes, there are, particularly in medicine, I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a well sort of established pathway for or staying in Australia for those, those students who want to continue to live in Australia and perhaps face their life there um, for a period of time. So there are definitely options and opportunities there. Um, so along with health and illness, we have doctor and patient. And this is all to do with your clinical skills. How do you take, for example, a history from a patient? How do you draw blood? How do you uh, examine a patient? Uh, resuscitate a patient is all included in doctor and patient. And then aspects of the healthcare system. Um, we have, like in, like in Canada, we have an indigenous population. Um, what are the aspects about that population which uh, is not really serviced very well um, by the health system? Um, how do we establish cultural safety, for example, in dealing with people um, from diverse, diverse ethnicities? Australia is a diverse country, of course. Um, and then how does the health system sort of deliver its services to the population um, equitably? Um, and which parts of society are still poorly serviced in, in many ways. Um, advanced studies is a research component uh, running across the four years. In reality, students really get some tuition in the first year of the MD about what research methodologies uh, are and what they might want to take forward. They then largely do a project of their own choice, um, usually starting in, in the second year of the MD. They don't do much in the third year, but fourth year they usually come back with a finalised sort of output, it might be a presentation, a research paper, or a presentation of a conference, for example, as their output for their advanced studies. A lot of flexibility in that in the advanced studies program. It could be anything from laboratory science uh, projects to um, epidemiology studies, for example. As you progress through the course, you go more and more from theory into clinical practice, but you will, from the first week, in fact, have contact with patients under controlled conditions. So as you develop your skills over the first two years, you get more and more opportunity to practice those skills, first in the clinical uh, simulation unit and then with patients directly. 
But by the third year, you're really progressing into your clinically intensive years, uh, where you do rotations for six weeks in all of the major disciplines of the hospital. So for example, you spend six weeks in um, paediatrics, six weeks in emergency medicine, um, uh, six weeks in the ICU, for example, um, as you do your rotations. And you'll be there for six weeks joining the treating team, doing the ward rounds in the morning, um, seeing patients as they're admitted into hospital, treated, and then hopefully um, discharged from hospital. Um, so you think about all the things that can happen in six weeks in a major hospital. And if you're in the paediatrics, for example, you'll have babies um, born prematurely from that time. You'll have uh, infants coming in with severe sort of respiratory illnesses or other problems. You'll, be, you'll have children, infants born with um, congenital problems. Um, so six weeks is a long time in the hospital. And so students get exposure to a tremendous amount of uh, sort of case load opportunity in that time. As you progress through, there are chances in the fourth year to do periods of, of your clinical studies outside of Flinders. So you might put some electives together, for example, and come back to Canada for 12 weeks um, to do uh, supervised placement back in Canada to see really what your local health system, how that works, and um, establish some, some links and contacts back here, for example. Um, so what someone's asking about dropout rates, um, one thing I will say about dropout rates, if you get an offer um, for a place in our course, we know that you can pass it. So I, I wouldn't have any anxiety about sort of starting and not finishing. Generally what trips people up, and yes there are some, some people that don't finish medical school, what generally trips them up is their private life, not their um, academic one. Because to get into medicine, you have to be academically capable, and we don't let people in that we think won't pass the course. So I think if you get an offer for, for medicine, you can assume that if you apply yourself, you will pass the course. I don't have any issues saying that. Um, from my experience with the undergraduate uh, international students, all of them so far have progressed into the MD, and there's been very few that have failed to, to finish their studies successfully. OK, there's not much more just to say about the course. I'll just go into some of the methods that we use to teach it. Perhaps it would be an indication of um, the style of learning perhaps that you'll get in the course. Um, so we do actually have a team-based learning approach, but we have multiple methods of delivering this course. So for example, in any one week, um, for two weeks ago, for example, was the immunology block in um, the MD year one. So students attended some lectures in the morning, for example, in immunology. They then went to their clinical skills in the afternoon in different groups. Um, they had practicals, they had workshops, they had tutorials. And on Friday they had their mini test, which they have every week. Um, this one was on immunology. In the morning they have a, a sort of a, what's called a, a ready, readiness for assessment test. You sit your test individually, then in, in teams. Um, we then talk about the results, any, any things that have gone well or haven't gone well with the students as, as a group. And then we have an application session in the afternoon where we present clinical uh, examples and students get to sit in their TBL team and hypothesize on what's going on, come up with treatment strategies and, and answer questions and things. Uh, and this is based really on this programmatic assessment for learning. So, this programmatic assessment is based on the concept that if we test students multiple times over perhaps their course in small blocks, every week they get some assessment pieces done, and we feed that assessment back to them, students become very, very good at assessing or self-assessing where they're sitting in the course. Um, so we've moved away from these barrier exams um, that are typical in many courses to this ongoing assessment so students can track where they're going, how they're going in the course um, on an ongoing basis, and they know well in advance what their strengths and weaknesses are. And it allows them to work and tailor what they're doing um, to suit their own personality, for example, and strengths and weaknesses. They, the students themselves comment on this in the portfolio setting, um, and their comments are sort of assessed by learning coaches. So they get to meet their learning coach on a regular basis and talk about how well they're doing in the course, what are their strengths, where they think, for example, they, they, they need to um, put a bit more effort in, um, where they think they're doing well. Um, so really it's a self-regulated learning environment. And students are really taken to this. This is a, 
a novel approach at Flinders, really. Most other schools around the country don't use this approach, but this is an excellent way of students knowing where they are uh, in the course, how well they're doing, and there's no big surprises really at the end of the of an exam. Now, someone's asked about a maximum age for student acceptance. We don't have any. Um, the, the set of maximal age will be discrimination. We don't discriminate at, um, on age in our course for, for entry, um, just like we don't discriminate on, on gender or any other uh, of those factors. Um, early patient contact, absolutely within a week of starting, you should be out on the wards taking the history. And that early contact will just continue in a more advanced level as you learn your clinical skills. And clinical skills are developed in students. You don't start with it. We, we train it in. Um, obviously, students will develop a lot of skills over the course. Um, we have an excellent simulation unit uh, for clinical skills. We use a, a mix of mannequins, um, actors, clinical trainers um, to, to provide you with the opportunity to develop your skills. You're never put under a situation, for example, where you're forced to do something that you're uncomfortable with uh, in terms of patients before you're ready. So before you're expected to demonstrate your skills on a patient, you absolutely have multiple opportunities to get comfortable with it uh, in the clinical skills unit. So don't fear about being put, put in the deep end here. Um, it's all about developing competency and then demonstrating that competency. So these, these are some of the units. This is a, it's a little bit hard to see on the that washed out, but this is one of the mannequins used. We have them extremely advanced mannequins. They can have a heartbeat. Um, they can sort of speak through a uh, connection with a person behind us in, in another room, for example. They can show signs of um, fainting. They can they have a pulse. They have all sorts of things. So students get to develop a lot of skills about the managing people in, in, in medical stress situations prior to having to get out of the wards and actually show those sort of things. But those um, mannequins in the advanced data trance are phenomenal and they're an excellent learning tool. This is the um, life saving or uh, resuscitation training, which is also included in the course and is an important part of any medical student's training. And just showing some of the uh, students, for example, the student on placement in the pediatric unit during their six week rotation. And here, of course, you're working with a an interdisciplinary team with nursing staff, other medical professionals, uh, registrars, interns, for example, all working in the uh, health environment of the hospital. So Flinders Medical Centre is the largest teaching hospital and public hospital in South Australia, so you get a huge range of um, medical experience. Now, in terms of the admission requirements, so a lot of people want to know what you need to actually get in. So obviously, if you're coming in as a graduate, you will be completing or have completed a degree. So we're looking for a credit or GPA average around the credit range. So if it was a GPA of four, that system would be a 3.2 out of four. So we're not asking for incredibly high levels for applications. We're just setting the GPA range, the equivalent of a five out of seven, which is a credit average. We then also set minimums for, for example, the MCAT or GAMSAT. So we're looking for scores of 123 in each section or higher and with a total of 492. So that gives you some perspective. Um, for GAMSAT, it's a 50 or above in each section with an average of 50 at least. So these, these minimums um, are much sort of more conservative than perhaps domestic students would expect um, to be successful. And really, to be honest, for international students, the competition is less. Uh, compared to domestic students wanting to enter our program. So you're in a much better position in terms of uh, potential offers because the competition is not so high. We actually have something like 2,000 people applying um, to our medical school every year for about 120 domestic places. We have up to 30 international places available um, in heading into MD year one, for example, each year. Um, so we will sort of give out offers based on how many students we're looking for at any one time. Can people get slightly lower marks? Yes, let's say that you have, um, so the question is, can people get in with scores that are slightly lower in one of these areas? So yes, if you have a GPA that's extremely high or, or better than 3.2, for example, it might be 3.4, um, but your MCAT score is just below this, for example, we can often 
do a bit of a balancing act and come up with a compromise. So absolutely, if you're near enough on these scores, please send in an application and we will accept it. Um, what we do then is offer an interview. So assuming that you meet these criteria, we'll send out an interview offer. Um, these can be the face-to-face, -face, perhaps, if, you know, while we're perhaps in the country, you can have a face-to-face -face or we'll do a Skype interview. Either way, um, we then combine the scores. If your interview is goes well, obviously that will be, um, I would say, highly likely that you'll get an offer, I would say, for, for a placement this year, um, for starting next year. Um, for the undergraduates, it's a similar arrangement. We're looking for a certain academic scores. We would, uh, there's, there's various year 12 systems around, so whatever the equivalent of the 95 8 are, and I hear locally it's 90. Um, but Martin's just putting in, absolutely, please contact the agent for a little bit more clarification on the scores. And certainly if you're wondering whether your scores are high enough, then they'll be able to tell you straight out whether you're in the ballpark or whether they can talk to the university about your application a little bit more. Um, currently the ISAP score of 50% ranking or above is what we're asking for. Um, most people are not that familiar with ISAP, it's a three hour multi-choice test. But please keep an eye on this space, we'll be talk talking to our sort of admissions team about um, the use of ISAP perhaps in the future. Um, interviews are based at the moment on these sort of scores. Um, at the moment if you do reach this ATAR 95 equivalent and have your ISAP score, we do offer you an interview. And then the interview for the undergraduate is more of a yes or no. So effectively we decide um, after the interview whether we offer a, a place or we don't based on the interview score. And the interview is what we're looking for, as I mentioned before, is really your communication skills and basic social skills really. Because um, we know that you need those good communication and good social skills to do well in your clinical training. Um, just a little bit about the student, the ISAP test. Um, there are test centres around the place. There might not be that many in Canada. We'll have to look into what the availability is of those centres. But um, typically, it runs from March to mid-February of the next year in terms of the round of this test. So you can sit the test um, once during this calendar year, for example. Um, there's a little bit of information on it. It's largely a reasoning, a critical and quantitative reasoning test, in other words, basic intelligence test, um, in a, a multi choice format. <coughs> so 100 questions, all multi choice, um, done over three hours. So I'll just talk a little bit about living on campus. So I've, I've obviously presented um, the two pathways in, the basic requirements. Uh, for the courses, most international students decide to live on campus and we have a couple of options, either dormitory or sort of apartment style living. Um, we do have actually have an arrangement where medical students, either undergraduate or graduate, have first preference for the Flinders housing option. And most students so far have chosen to take that up. The few students that haven't always sort of regret not doing so because it's an excellent social environment there. It's a great opportunity to get um, friends. There's lots of support. For example, it's very, very convenient. You can just walk to your lectures. You can walk to the medical centre quite easily. Um, Flinders Living, if you choose that option, comes and picks you up at the airport when you first arrive. So there's lots of um, good things associated with the uh, Flinders Living arrangement on campus. Um, Gus is just asking if you have 30 seats for undergraduate program, how many students apply? It does vary. Um, a couple of years ago, for example, we had 80 to 100 students that might be applying uh, and were suitable. This year, I would expect something in the vicinity of 70 to 80 or, or so students, but it does vary. Um, so at the moment, I think this year is probably a really good year for um, your chances coming in. There's a few changes around in our typical markets for the undergraduate. For example, the Singapore market for us has changed a little bit and there are sort of extra places that normally Singaporean students would be taking that prep would be available for other students. Um, yeah, just a little bit more about Flinders Living. So you can have either catered or non-catered uh, apartment or dormitory style. Most students, if they do start in the dormitory, would move to the apartment uh, living once they've found a few people that they think they can live with uh, in the student form and some friends hopefully. Um, 
But um, yeah, some excellent options there and very, very convenient. And um, obviously you don't need crap. You may choose not to buy a car, for example, if you live on campus. There's a lot of bus connectivity to the city and other areas. And we're also getting a train station built at the medical centre, which will be about a 25 minute journey into the city and centre of Adelaide itself. So that's going to be extremely convenient. Um, so it's an excellent option. Um, there's a few uh, sort of testimonials from students. We've had um, typically a lot of students coming from Singapore, um, but also uh, Canada has been a, a previously very successful market for us. Um, so over the years we've had a number of North American students, um, both from the USA and Canada coming into our course. Um, you can probably look up these testimonials a bit later perhaps if you do run the, the cast. And um, why choose to some excellent sort of points about the course, um, very well recognised nationally and internationally, and that's been borne out by our sort of very successful accreditation processes. Um, recognised around the world um, by a number of jurisdictions, including uh, Canada, and has been a very innovative course over the years in terms of uh, Australia. Um, yeah, and things like the housing on campus being guaranteed, I think, is a bonus for particularly undergraduate students. It takes all the stress out of finding accommodation if you're moving to a new country, which is just one less thing you have to worry about. And really the access to the Flinders Medical Centre. Now most of your studies, as I said, will be at the Flinders Medical Centre, but as a student, as you progress through the course, you'll also get opportunities to experience medicine in metropolitan um, sort of frontline medical um, sort of options, such as a GP clinic, um, some rural medicine, some regional medicine, all of that will be experienced in your course, not just um, at Flinders Medical Centre, but in other health settings as well around the city of Adelaide and more sort of distal and in regional areas, for example, for brief periods. Um, yeah, just a few other things. Australian culture and lifestyle. A lot of people are interested in, in Australia. It's a nice place to live. I've lived, I'm born in New Zealand, but I moved there um, in my late teens and I've never regretted it. It's a fantastic place to live. So if you're interested in living a slightly different life, um, that's an excellent way to, to give them a bit of experience. Um, clinical rural school. So someone's asked about our rural clinical schools. Um, so Flinders is actually um, the biggest trainer of rural medicine in the state. We have an agreement with the federal government of Australia to have 30% of our domestic intake coming into the MD being from rural or regional backgrounds. So they are favoured. There's a quote of those students now. They're favoured over, um, you know. Um, students coming from the city itself. So we actually also have made multiple um, regional centres and clinical schools uh, run from centres. We actually also have a parallel medical curriculum up in the Northern Territory of Australia. So um, Flinders is actually a major trainer of rural doctors in Australia. Um, so those of you interested in rural medicine, you will actually get a chance to experience rural medicine in your study. Um, you won't to quite the extent that domestic students do, because some students in the domestic program are bonded to the federal government um, through the rural intake um, to practice medicine in rural settings once they graduate, and they get first preference for the parallel curriculum, for example, which is delivered away from centres. So while the international students don't get options to go into that parallel rural curriculum, they do get um, experience of rural medicine through the course but they will remain largely in the medical centre space. And the final slide that I had really was about some of the graduates. Obviously, our graduates have gone all over the place. We've had more than, I think, 3,000 graduates now through the medical school over the years. We've had chief medical officers of Australia and South Australia, heads of major research um, organisations in the country and all over other organisations. So our graduates have gone all over the place and have been very successful. We have member, members of parliament, um, MPs that were portfolio holders for, for health, for example, all graduates of the program over the years. Um, Sarah says, I couldn't hear how many students apply. Um, Sarah, it, it does vary. So I would say um, it's anywhere from you know, 70 to 80 students to 150. It just depends on the year and, and what the demand is. 
So internship locally, I'd assume, is the question. So someone's asking after medical school, you know, uh, what are the chances of getting an intern year? Um, so in Australia, and South Australia is no different, domestic students get first preference for um, intern places, which is unfortunate. Um, the university doesn't supply those in, intern places. We supply, obviously, the degree and the education, but the local health um, uh, systems, really, that supply and train the intern places. Having said that, there are a number of students who are international students who do get local uh, intern places, so it's not at all a rule that, that international students don't get places. It's up to the availability of those intern uh, positions. So if there are intern positions available, international students can absolutely apply to them, both in South Australia and in other states of Australia. And up until very recently, South Australia has had an excellent um, record with placing its international students locally. Um, the federal government has also recently started funding an additional 150 places for international students. So hopefully that will also address some of the shortfalls that have been occurring. Um, those shortfalls, by the way, are much more acute on the eastern seaboard of Australia in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, they've been experiencing problems with intern places for their international students for, for many, many years. South Australia has been lucky in many ways, but we, we can't guarantee that and we can't see into the future. Um, so we're looking you know, five or, or seven years into the future for students applying this year for starting next year anyway. So a lot of changes can happen in that time, but we, all, we always say to students, keep an eye on what's going on. Um, the, the university and the student body advocate both federally and locally for increased intern opportunities for international students, and the university is, is absolutely on the case all the time trying to improve the situation. But we're hopeful that um, most students, if they do wish to get an intern place in Australia, would be successful. It may take them a little bit longer, perhaps, than a domestic student, or they may not get their first preference, but we, we hope that you know, in time those students would be successful in getting an intern place. So I think that might be the end of, yeah, so, so effectively that's the end of my official presentation. So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to, to hang around online for a little bit longer to, to wait for you to feed those through. But in the meantime, I'll say thank you very much for tuning in, and um, particularly those who have uh, you know, chosen to spend some time listening live. It's been a pleasure to present the course to you. Um, I've been talking to the agents here, Martin and, and Sue, about the course, about the problems perhaps that Canadian students might be facing about it. And so we're, we're always listening and, and trying to adapt what we're doing to suit. Um, we don't want any barriers. Um, you know, to, to the process, we want people to be able to apply and not sort of be held back by any, any problems. So we, we're always trying to address any problems as they arise. Um, so if you do have any feedback, absolutely talk to the agents and they can talk to us. Yeah. Um, what about deadlines? Someone has just asked. We really will be holding this process open until very late in the year. Um, you can apply even if it's provisionally. So if we get your application in, what we try and do um, at, the, at the moment, the college is trying to talk to the International Centre at the university and get applications which are coming through and looked at. We can provide, for example, provisional offers if people are waiting on results, for example, still haven't finished their studies. Um, so, so, yeah, if you're hoping to apply, absolutely, most of the time you, you have time to get all your, all your ducks in a row let's say, before um, the process ends. Just keep in mind, though, that um, the course starts, if you're a graduate entry, starts mid-February next year. If you're an undergraduate, it starts late February. Um, so obviously you'd need time to organise these. So applications really past November will be starting to get a bit late. Um, so I'd say prior to November is an excellent um, time. Um, but the next few months will be fantastic. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, so I'm very happy to sign off. But um, yes, yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. And yeah, perhaps I'll catch up with you next time we do a webinar.